I say the word student athlete, what comes to mind? Maybe it's the college football game you defaulted to so you could avoid another Geico commercial. Maybe it's the freshman that swam away to an Olympic gold medal in between classes. Or maybe it's that kid at the dining hall with like five plates who's going back for seconds and thirds. <laughs> I actually got to laugh at that one because anyone who actually knows me knows that that, that last kid is, is definitely me. You see, as both student and athlete, I get this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to take the passion I've cultivated on the field into the classroom, into a place where professors teach us to challenge ourselves, a, a, a place where we learn to challenge each other, a place where we explore new ways of challenging the world around us. But the very challenge of living between the whistle and the school bell comes with so much more than shuffling into class after practice or finding new ways to smuggle food into philosophy lectures or actually, in my case, waking up at 5 a.m. to practice and just hoping you don't get a cold call during contract law. But it does come with this challenge of identity at times, of reconciling who you are and how your voice is going to be used with who the world expects you to be and the boxes that we often find ourselves put in. And maybe you agree with me. Maybe this is something that we all experience in terms of challenge. But it is important to note that these challenges don't show any prejudice towards age or whether you're a freshman or in graduate school. You see, I was only a sophomore when George Zimmerman murdered Trayvon Martin. And looking at the article briefly, my notions of justice and fair play didn't at all agree with what the courts had ruled or even how something like this could happen. But I mean, what was I going to do? I was, I was just a student. And at that time, to be honest, going to law school was out of the question. It was expensive. And we all know lawyers talk entirely too much. But in looking at this child's face, I, I couldn't shake this uncanny resemblance he had to these everyday people in my life. You see, Trayvon was my little brother. Trayvon was my teammate that measured out my distances in long jump. Trayvon was even the kid in my English lecture that waved me down when there was nowhere else to sit. So naturally, I, I took to Twitter just, just to post a comment wishing that his life, his family, his legacy, like all of us, received justice. And to be honest, this is no different than the way I feel about the law now. Because regardless of what you look like, what you believe, or where you're from, we all deserve justice. And I believe that. Don't you? But what people said about what I had tweeted is actually why I'm here today. You see, people told me I should stick to running in circles. People told me that I should let regular individuals handle this. People even told me I should stick to playing in the sand. And at that very moment, as a student athlete, I had no voice. My voice went only about as far as I could jump or as far as my athletic ability. How devastating. But suddenly, this was about so much more than being a student athlete. This is about being a human being, a human being without a voice. And I'm wondering if this sounds like any of you. I mean, seriously, how, how different is, is this from raising your hand in class or writing an op-ed or kneeling at a football game? Is it any different than standing alongside those in support of the Women's March or standing behind our military during times of controversy? Why on earth are we so hard on people that step outside of this box and challenge perspectives? Why, for example, aren't we encouraging more student-athletes to use their voice? And how did we get here? How do we get to this point in society where we're reducing people to these one-dimensional characteristics that don't even begin to do justice to their, their potential and their voice? Now, I got to be honest, I, I, I might never find the answer to any of these questions, but a month after this happened, I certainly thought I did. You see, I found myself among scores of other travelers enjoying the, the warm hospitality of airport security. And I didn't think I looked too abnormal. I mean, I mean, I had a cinnamon-colored suit on with a charcoal gray tie. It actually seemed to fit. And, and to be honest with you, none of that mattered because for the first time in like three months, I had managed to get all of the sand out of my socks, which is a huge accomplishment for people in my event. <laughs> but even with all that being said, someone still managed to come up to me and ask me what team I played for. And, and, and how this person knew I was an athlete still escapes me to this day. But I tell him I'm a proud Lobo. He asks me what sport I play, what my event is, how far I jump. He wishes me well, and we go our separate ways. But when I got to my plane, I'm overhearing another conversation between a passenger and a student that sounds strikingly identical to mine. 
except for the questions they're being asked. Questions like, what's your major? Why'd you choose the school you chose? And what are you going to do after you graduate? And as I'm looking out of the window, I couldn't help but wonder why no one ever asked me these questions. And honestly, it brought me back to the tweet I had sent about Trayvon Martin a month prior. And, and a couple of the dots started co to connect for me. You see, maybe the issue that society has with student athletes using their voice, or, or even just athletes using their voice, has nothing to do with our majors or where we go to school. Because maybe the real problem is that society doesn't believe that student athletes are really students at all. And, and, and this, is, this, is, this, is, this is something that's so amazing to me because, I mean, maybe they don't want to. Maybe because to them we're just entertainment. I mean, we're the people that you turn to when Monday Night Football is over or when the World Series ends or if you didn't get tickets to the World Cup. I mean, of course, fans will come out to the games, they'll listen to the radio interviews, they'll even stream the top 10 plays of the season. But how many college sports fans that you know can honestly tell you anything about the academic pursuits of any of their favorite student athletes? It's a striking finding, really, because even looking statistically at a, at a, at a spectator sport like football, with over 74,000 student athletes, only 250 of them roughly are going to get drafted to the NFL. This means that over 73,000 of these kids are going to go pro in something other than their sport. They're going to contribute to society in ways that go far beyond what they were ever going to do athletically. And yet these same individuals are told that their voice only goes as far as they could throw a football. The very minute we step outside of this box that we've been put in, we're told we have to be quiet. And as I look at all of you, I can't help but wonder how many of you guys have ever been there? How many of you guys have ever been told to keep your opinions and your perspectives to yourselves because it supposedly went outside your scope? A scope that may have been because of where you were from, what you looked like, or what you believed? You see, the very minute we believe this lie that our perspectives and our, 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 our story is irrelevant, we stop using our voice altogether. But I'm wondering, if you stopped using your voice, whose story wouldn't get told? You see, anytime we muzzle groups and, and other people, we don't just miss out on these critical opportunities to learn. We miss out on perspectives. We miss out on these stories that inspire and fill us with courage. And it's in this way that your voice is, is really one of the highlights of life, in part because wherever you go, your story goes with you. And the world is just waiting to hear the story the world is waiting to hear from you. For anyone that's, that's gone to school, engaging with the world around us and challenging perspectives is the very essence of our educational system. But how can we sit here and say that we endorse this model of growth and scholarship through learning if we're discouraging people from using their voice? How can we actually say that? And, and, and for student athletes, this is something that's incredibly important to us because this is one of the very many ways that, that we learn. In fact, to this day, one of my favorite quotes out of my philosophy class came, came from Plato as, as he's talking about justice. And he actually goes on to say that in order for man to succeed in life, God gave, God gave us these two things. Not to be used separately as one for the soul and one for the body, but to be used together. And that it's through these means of education and physical activity that man could actually achieve perfection. Now, no one's perfect, but, but this, this idea of creating a union between athletics and academics is the very nature of being a student athlete or even just staying physically active while you're in school. And it's because of this that there's not a single person in the world that can tell me that academics and athletics don't go together. But even with all that being said, this doesn't make speaking out any easier. We still need to be strategic and think critically about the issues that we're actually addressing. We need to understand the, these risks and be willing to commit to our cause beyond circumstance. And in order to do this, we need the support of our peers. And we need the support because the world is waiting to hear from you. You see, this land is, is supposed to be your land. This land is supposed to be my land too, but if this land is truly meant for you and me, then why don't we encourage each other to draw out this voice within all of us? Because the, the world is waiting to hear from you. Everyone has this unique story, this, this voice that is 
so specific to our own experiences. And for every one person that has the courage to use their voice wisely, they enable dozens more to do the same. When I was first starting out and, and figuring out how I was going to use my voice and, and really where I fit in the world, all I wanted was for one day my community and my country to hear from me. And I stand before you today as an Olympic hopeful and a law student at Georgetown University and realizing that the time to use your voice is right now. The time for you to use your voice is right now. The world hopefully will one day hear from me, but your time is now because the world is waiting to hear from you. Thank you.